Great to see you again. Um, if you've been following along with us, you'll know that there are two primary sets of English North American colonies that have been established by the mid-1620s. Um, you've got the tobacco colonies in uh, Virginia and Maryland. About 500 miles to the north, you've got the New England colonies settled by Puritans and uh, religious exiles that were hoping to purify their church, uh, to, to, to look to the new world uh, for religious freedom. And today, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about another batch of English colonies. And similar to everything that we've discussed thus far, they're going to have a very important influence on American political thought. And so with that being said, um, I want to I want to briefly review how the English governed their empire in North America and how that was really different, unique, as opposed to the Spanish or the French. If you recall, one of the things that the government was doing was really encouraging people to come over, incentivizing it with land, and really loosely governing over those people once they got there. Um, if you want self-representative government, you can have it. If you want an independent court system, that's fine too. Um, the reason is pretty simple. Unlike the Spanish or the French, the English model of imperialism is based on agriculture and you need labor for agriculture. And so it really is that case of the more the merrier and you, you, you want to entice uh, as many people as possible to come on over. And giving them some say in their day-to-day -day life was one of several ways that the government was able to do that. That might be really good for getting people to come over, um, you know, come to Massachusetts and you'll call your own shots. The problem, if you're in the business of empire building, is that it's not exactly conducive. It's not exactly complementary when it comes to building and sustaining authority. And you need authority if, you, if you're in the business of imperialism. One individual that understands this pretty clearly is the King of England, uh, a guy by the name of Charles II. I don't want you to focus too much on English monarchs or European history. It's not a European history class, but it's important that you understand that Charles kind of gets it. He kind of understands that maybe this is a case of letting the cat out of the bag. And maybe too much power over there in America is not good for these colonists. After all, they are English subjects. They just happen to be standing on a different continent. To get them back under control, one idea that he had was to establish a new batch of colonies that he's going to call the Restoration Colonies. Think about that for just a second. Restoration, restore, restoring of what? It's restoring the king's authority. That's worth writing down. The restoration colonies were designed, uh, emphasis on the word designed, to restore the king's authority. Keep in mind, guys, it's, uh, it's that old adage, it's hard to teach a new, uh, an old dog new tricks. And, uh, you know, I mean, think places like Virginia were already settled. So the king went in there right now and said, uh, I'm going to need you to do X and Y and Z. Um, that might not be greeted with so much enthusiasm. So what he's going to try to do is set up a new series of colonies and, and, and make sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to who's in charge. And hopefully the tobacco colonies and the New England colonies will follow suit. One of the first places that you see the English trying to establish these restoration colonies is in between New England and Virginia. Massive chunk of land there. Charles was deeply in debt to the Penn family. And he reached out to this wealthy Englishman by the name of William Penn and pretty much explained, I don't have a lot of money, but one thing that I do have a lot of is land over in America, and I would be glad to give you some of that land, and you, you might even make more money than I owe you with the land. William Penn is already a very rich man. And uh, he's not really all that interested in, in money per se. What he's really interested in is establishing a safe haven, a safe home for his fellow Quakers. By his religion, William Penn was a Quaker and not that different from the Puritans. They were a religious minority in England and uh, they, they weren't treated as well as um, everybody else for the most part. And so you can imagine where he's going with this idea of establishing, you know, a place where you can practice your religion freely, openly, and without interference of the state. And so he gladly jumps at the chance to take Charles up on that free land. 
In any case, William Penn is going to go on to become the founder of the colony that will bear his name, Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania is going to be established as a place where you can practice your religion, be that Quaker or otherwise, free and without fear of interference. That's great, but it doesn't exactly scream the king is in charge, the king is in control. The establishment of religious freedom in Pennsylvania is not exactly doing what Charles had hoped that it would do. Maybe there'd be better luck in what would come to be known as the Carolinas. The Carolinas were sort of governed by this concept of the fundamental constitutions. But through the fundamental constitutions, what the king did was established a, a couple dozen landlords, and he pretty much made them in charge. Think of this almost like a mafia boss. Um, you can do what you want to do, but ultimately you answer to me. And that's exactly what these landlords would do, including um, recruit a labor force. Now, again, you, you got to use a little bit of common sense here. One of the things that the people that are going to establish both North and South Carolina are going to do is try to recruit that labor force. But to do that, you, you can't say, come to South Carolina where you'll bake in the sun and you'll break your back from the labor regime. You got to put lipstick on the pig. Just like anything else that, that, that might constitute a sales job, you got to convince them why it would be good for them to come there. My point, although on paper the fundamental constitutions emphasize that the king was in charge and it was his way or the highway, many times it was not as harsh as draconian as that. Many, many times they bent the rules and actually went out of their way on occasion to demonstrate that you could have a lot of discretion, a could, you could have a lot of decision-making power on your own, so come to the Carolinas. The Carolinas don't do what the king wants them to do any more than Pennsylvania does. And so, generally speaking, the restoration colonies are not exactly very successful when it comes to restoring the king's authority. One caveat that I want to mention before we go any further, and that would be the Navigation Acts. What the Navigation Acts say, or nothing really new, it just simply says that because you are an English subject, you're an English citizen, by law, you can only do business with other English citizens, English companies. Now, I say that that was not new. We, we've talked about mercantilism. We've talked about it with Queen Elizabeth. We've talked about it in the Virginia colony. We know that it was designed to grow the English economy from the inside out in the sense that it was designed to keep English money in English hands. If you're an English shipping company in Boston, then the only kind of insurance companies that you can use to insure your ships and cargo would be English. You can see how this is supposed to function. And on paper, once again, in the 1620s, it's there. But will it be, will it be enforced? Stay tuned. For right now, I want you to understand how diverse Pennsylvania was as a colony. And um, part of the reason that it was probably the most, at least on the, on the whole, the most diverse colony in the empire was because William Penn advertised for immigrants in, in, in lots of different languages. Um, he got English colonists, he got Irish, Scottish, Welsh, German, Swiss, Dutch, French, people from the Caribbean even came up. Um, Africans were imported as a labor force, and of course, Native Americans. Now, again, connect the dots here. You, you've got lots of different people living under one roof, and you've got lots of different languages that are spoken, and lots of different cultures. And in, 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 in the central part of all of this, you've got the biggest and, and probably the most diverse urban center in the colonies, and that'd be Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia was one, one of the largest cent urban centers in the English North American system. And it's also, on any given day, probably the most diverse city. Um, you could walk down the streets of Philadelphia and hear French and Spanish and English and German, and you could name a number of different languages, all of which would have been spoken. Which is why colonial Philadelphia really does drive at the concept of American exceptionalism in the sense that there is no American race, there is no American DNA. 
nothing does a better job than Philadelphia when it comes to you know, providing an example as America the Great melting pot. Of course, all of these people are going to interact with one another and, and probably best cases would be business and other sort of financial dealings. And they're going to influence each other. They'll influence each other culturally. They'll influence each other politically. They'll influence each other um, socially as well. Good example as to who or what I'm talking about would be a German-born immigrant, a guy by the name of Conrad Weiser. The best way that I have to describe who Conrad Weiser uh, was, was, was what you and I would call a diplomat, a go-between, a guy that made sure that things were good with the Native Americans, uh, but that the Europeans got their points across and everybody lived happily ever after. He's going to team up with a Native American within the region, a guy by the name of Shikalami. And together, what they're going to do is they're going to put together a world of peaceful coexistence for basically their lifetimes. And as a matter of fact, when Shikalami and Conrad Weiser died, that's when relations between the European settlers and the Native Americans within the region began to deteriorate. Um, it's not something that you can just go ahead and do if you put your mind to it. Being a diplomat being somebody that can reach out across the aisle to engage other groups and bring them into some sort of peaceful understanding, that's certainly a skill, and not everybody possesses that skill. Conrad Weiser certainly did. But pushing forward, um, as you might be able to tell, Charles was never very successful in restoring his authority. James II, next king of England, he's got to have a little bit more success. One of the things that he's going to do to really restore the king's authority across the board, he's not going to establish new colonies. Instead, what he's going to do is he's going to drive the Dutch out of America altogether. Keep in mind, when the Dutch came over to the Americas, they colonized what would later become New York State, New Jersey, and Delaware. Uh, these are going to be referred to the middle colonies, and you'll see much more directly what I'm talking about the next time we meet. But for right now, they were not English. They were Dutch. And a lot of people were doing business with the Dutch for the simple reason that it was cheaper. Um, the Dutch didn't tax their products, primarily because they were black market products. And so if you wanted tea or if you wanted ink or paper or whatever it is that you were trying to buy... Um, and you lived in a place like, let's say, Boston, there's a very good chance that you were doing business with the Dutch in New Jersey. Um, it was cheaper and more effective to do business. And James understands this. And he, so he says, what the hey, drive out the middleman, that being the Dutch, and you'll get rid of the problem. What he's basically doing here, guys, is, is he's enforcing the Navigation Acts. They're on the books. It says right there, plain as day, you can't do business with non-English companies, non-English businessmen. And what James is doing to really make sure that the letter of the law is being followed is, is getting rid of the people that are doing the business, and that would be the Dutch. Once again, you're going to see a lot more detail around this the next time we meet. But for right now, the other thing that James really begins to do is, is practice a growing philosophy, political philosophy. He, grow, uh, he practices this philosophy that will come to be known as absolutism, right? Why am I taking over the Dutch colonies in America? Well, I have the absolute power to do that, absolute authority. What absolutism drove at, its whole concept, revolved around the idea that absolute political power rested in the hands of the king in the hands of the monarch. Absolute authority to carry out his will as he saw fit was James's prerogative, okay? And when pressed, well, why is that the way that it is? Why are you doing that? And James did what European monarchs have been doing for a thousand years. He said, well, God Almighty wants it that way. God chose me to be king of England. God chose you to be a worker in England. And it's my way or the highway because God wants it that way. Pretty simple enough. Bottom line is, he's got the power, and you don't. Well, as it turns out, um, James was probably even less popular on the English side of the Atlantic as opposed to the American side. Um, absolutism didn't win him any fans in England any more than it did in the American colonies. What really gets him into hot water would be the fact that he happens to be Catholic. 
Um, England, at this point in time, is a great Protestant nation, and having an English monarch on the throne that happens to be a Catholic, that became problematic. But what became even more problematic is when his wife, who was of Spanish origin, um, gave birth to a son who would also be a Catholic. And there were people in England at the time, uh, we don't really need to get into this, but people in England that would not stand for it. The, the, the Catholicism combined uh, with his absolutism was much too much for many people to bear. And long story short, they drove James into exile. James will abdicate the throne. He'll flee to Holland. And what England will get in his place, the two people, they almost look like children, but the two people that you're looking at there on the screen, that would be William and Mary of Orange. What's important about William and Mary is the fact that they're constitutional monarchs. Now, that's very important. It's worth writing down. And even if you have to put me on pause, uh, you need to understand this. When I say constitutional monarchs, what I mean is that they govern with limited authority. It's not absolutism. What William and Mary agree to do is govern in conjunction with lawmaking bodies in England, like Parliament. Um, what this comes to be known as would be the Glorious Revolution. The process of James being driven out of England was glorious. It was glorious because they got rid of a problem. It was even more glorious because it was a nonviolent, bloodless revolution. But what was probably most glorious of all to people that were political thinkers at the time would be the fact that when William and Mary came in, they governed in agreement with other people in the parliament, that'd be their version of Congress, uh, and that's a self-representative form of government. And so this concept of democracy, it's not as far off as it once upon a time was, and the Glorious Revolution was big, big news all throughout the English North American colonies. And part of this revolution was premised on the political writings of the, arguably the most famous English philosopher, a guy by the name of John Locke. And certainly this is not going to be the last time that we talk about Locke, but for right now, everybody, John Locke was a very prolific writer. He wrote this piece called The Two Treatises on Government. And in it, what he basically says is, uh, the government, however you want to define that, king, president, whatever, government gets its power from the people. It's the absolute op opposite of absolutism. It's not that God wants you to have power. It's that governmental power derives from the people when they give up their own individual rights to do as they please, and they entrust them. They give those rights over to the government for the protection that the government offers. But what I need you to understand here is pretty simple and straightforward. Government gets its power from the people. And the only legitimate forms of government are the government where the people have already consented to be governed. In other words, I don't consent. Your laws, your power is not legitimate. If you want to tax me, then you need to give me representation in whatever lawmaking body we're talking about, Congress, Parliament, what have you. Okay, John Law was widely, widely read throughout the English North American colonies and household names that you would recognize if I rattled them off my tongue, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin. They used to walk around their respective cities with a with a copy of John Locke in their front pockets, and they would read them collectively. They would read them voraciously, and he had a huge, huge impact on the political culture of the English North American colonies. And so once again, this is driving directly at the heart of that question that I introduced you to the other day. Uh, where does American political thought, where does it begin? This is another very important origin. It's going on in England, but it's having a very big impact on what would become the United States. And John Locke is really going to be an influential part of what we ultimately see emerge as the American form of government. For right now, that's all I've got. When we pick it up the next time, we'll diversify English North American life just a little bit more by talking about some more territories that will be added into 